Amen. Good evening, everybody. What a great bunch tonight. This is awesome. So glad to see you this evening. Uh, we're going to stand together and start singing 339. I will sing the wondrous story. Uh, and here comes Patrick to lead us in it. Number 339, verses 1, 2, and 5. Verses 1, 2, and 5. Let's stand together. 339. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, how he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through his loving arms around me, threw me back into his way. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by Crystal sea. All right, let's all gather around and have a time of fellowship. Amen. I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. He will keep me till the river roll its water at my feet. Then I'll bear me safely over where the loved ones I shall meet. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. Amen. Good singing. Let's go to our next song, 291 Higher Ground. First, second, fourth. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane than I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay, where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, 
my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. I faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still all great to have I found. Lord, lead me on a higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. By faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Uh, Brother Eddie Hernandez, would you come please lead us in a word of prayer as we begin tonight? When Brother Eddie says amen, you may be seated. And I thank you so much for being here tonight. Looking forward to a great time. Brother Eddie, God bless you, man. Pray for us, would you? Let's bow our heads. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for bringing us back to your house, Lord, tonight. Uh, please be with Pastor Woody as he um, preaches the message uh, tonight, Lord, and give him wisdom uh, to get his words out, Lord. And please um, be with, uh, with those up in Master Club tonight, Lord, as the children uh, learn those from uh, our teachers, Lord. And please just let us uh, fellowship after uh, the service this night, Lord, and be with one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Great to see you this evening. All right, uh, let's see. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to kind of dispense with most of the announcements with the exception of RBC Kids tomorrow at 4. And uh, don't forget about a combined teen activity, March the 4th, 4 p.m. at the Vogelway Bowling Center, which we did ver verify is now open. Just uh, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, but it's going to be open. And so we're going to be doing that. We've got uh, our teenagers, heritage teenagers, teenagers from Eiffel Baptist, and teenagers from Rhine River Baptist. So we're going to have a slew of teenagers and uh, looking forward to a great time. Um, just for moms and dads to be aware, um, a string of bowling costs about five bucks. If you have bowling shoes, then you don't have to rent them. But if you do rent them, they're for the kids. They're I think they're like two fifty for the adults. They're a little bit more. And uh, let's see. And then there's snack bar food that's available. They don't do uh, burgers, but they do chicken wings and they do French fries and they do all that kind of stuff. So um, that's what's going to be going on with that activity. That's March the fourth at the Vogelway Bowling Center. And uh, looking forward to a great time. Uh, with our teenagers for that. Okay, uh, what we're going to do right now, oh, I need to tell you this. So, did you enjoy Monday holiday? Did, did, I mean, some of you may have had to work, but did you enjoy Monday? If you had Monday off, did you enjoy it? Yes? Yes. Okay, so, so Kathy said, um, hey, we're going to go down to um, the Sar Park Mall. Have you ever been down there? Sar Park Mar in Neun uh, Mall in Neunkirchen, my favorite mall of all German malls, my favorite mall. As a matter of fact, it's my favorite mall of all malls. I just like it. It's the right size. It's got ice cream. It's, I mean, what's there not to like, right? And so, so I said, babe, what are we going down there for? And she said, I want to get some clothes and I want to get some shoes. And so we got home and I had a new sweater and new shoes and she had nothing. I thought, I said, this is great. This is awesome. I'm going to go shopping with her more often because I come back with stuff. So, <laughs> amen. But we had a great time and I uh, hope that you did as well. Um, okay, we're going to get right to our Bible quiz for tonight. <laughs> you can't raise your hand, Angel, until I tell you what it's about, okay? <laughs> okay, uh, it's a leadership Bible quiz, okay? So this is what our teams are for tonight. Brother Eddie, are you going to be my scorekeeper? Good deal. Okay, teams for tonight are football versus baseball. So that we're talking American football versus American baseball. I, I, when Kathy and I talked about it, I said, babe, what team should we do? She said, football and baseball. And I said, well, how about American football versus European football? She said, you'll split the church. Don't, don't do that. So I said, I said, that's probably a good point. So, uh, we're, so American football versus American baseball. So I need three kids for football, and I need two adults for football. Okay, Jace is one kid. Uh, Isaiah is one kid. i got to get a girl on football. Is there a girl that loves football? Got, I got any girls? That's uh, okay. You, you want to do it? Come on, buddy. That's fine. Yeah, okay, <laughs> awesome. Okay, now I need two adults for football. 
two adults for football, okay? Uh, let's see, two adults who, are, are you, are all of you baseball people, is that what you are? Or you just don't care about, okay, Miss Rita is a football person, good. I mean, there we go, Rebecca is now a football person, okay? All I can do is, all I can do is tell you this, um, they probably would tackle you pretty hard if they were, Okay, baseball, I need three kids. Uh, Mika is one of them. Uh, let's see, Kate is one of them. Steven's one of them. And <laughs> Angel, don't worry, you'll get your turn, okay. And now I need two adults for baseball. Two adults for baseball. Okay, we'll just stand here until I get two adults for baseball. Okay. Hmm. Okay, there's Fernando, good, amen, Fernando, good baseball kind of a guy. There we go, oh, praise the Lord, the slugger. Okay, thank you, man. Okay, so here's what the deal is. Um, you're going to get 250 points for your team for a correct answer. You get minus 100 points for an incorrect answer. You can shout out an answer. But be fair when you do it. Don't be trying to confuse people, okay? So, uh, oh, you got thrown under the bus right to the front here. Okay, so uh, if you're watching from home, call us uh, after the game is over, 017-1543-1760. Was it baseball or football that won at your house? So all of these questions are from the book of Proverbs. All of these questions deal with the topic of leadership in some way, shape, or form, okay? And all of them are fill in the blank, okay? So it's very simple, very simple, okay? Question number one for tonight. He that hateth covetousness shall prolong his blank go. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Life is the, no. Days. <laughs> Days. <laughs> Very good, though. I thought life, too. Okay. Uh, okay, so that is minus 100 for baseball. Okay. Question number two. Question number two. Ooh. Take away the wicked from before the blank. This is a direct quote from the book of Proverbs. Take away the wicked from before the, remember leadership, think leadership. From, say it louder, guys. <laughs> okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, oh, go, sorry. <laughs> Ah, uh, from the wise, from the king, from the king. The crew gave you an answer. Okay, this is question number three. Ready? Mika, Jace, you guys ready? Here we go. Question number three. The throne is blank by righteousness. That's not a second blank underneath that. That's just a line. The throne is blank by righteousness. Go. Established is correct. Very good. All right, question number four. Ready? We'll be listening too, okay, because they'll help you out. Question number four, here it is. A blank king scattereth the wicked. Go. <laughs> Stephen? Wise is correct. He beat you to it, buddy. Yeah. There you go. Good job. Good job for both of you. Okay, so that's 250 over here. All right. Question number five. Question number five. Every man's judgment cometh blank the Lord. Go. From is correct. From is correct. All right. Back to the mother-daughter um, face-off. Okay. Question number six. The king's favor is toward a blank servant. Go. Um. 
go. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Faithful is not right. It's wise. <laughs> it's wise, okay? Okay, now this is the husband-wife face-off. Here we go. Remember, no, no, no matter which team wins, you have to go home with each other. Okay? All right, good. Did you get that? No matter which team wins, you have to go home with her. Okay? <laughs> Question number seven. And it is, when the righteous are in blank, the people rejoice. Go. When the righteous are in blank, the people rejoice. The size of the blank might help you a little bit. I did say go. I did say go, yes. Now I've said it twice. <laughs> Rita, authority is correct. Very good. Jace, would you move the uh, squeaker to the middle there for me, just a little bit? There you uh, No, Jace, Jace, to the middle. There you go. <laughs> okay, question number eight. Number eight says this. Mercy and blank preserve the king. Go. Mercy and blank preserve the king. Hmm. What do you think? Jace. Grace, good answer, but it's truth. Minus 100 points over here. Okay, question number nine. He that hateth covetous, covetousness shall blank his days. Go. Uh, go ahead, buddy. I think you got there first. You got the, you pulled it, but he squeaked it. Go ahead. Prolong. Very good. Good job. Good job. Okay, question number 10. Two more to go. Question number 10. It is a blank to kings to commit wickedness. It is a blank to kings to commit wickedness. Go. Abomination is correct. Very good. All right, last question. You still have to take her home, okay? And you have to go home with her, okay? All right, good. Question number 11. <laughs> Here it is. Every blank judgment cometh from the Lord. Go. Every blank judgment cometh from the Lord. Go. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Every righteous, every man's judgment cometh from us. Minus 100 over here. Let's find out who our winner is in the auditorium. Brother Eddie, if you'll add them up for us. Football 900, baseball 100. Okay, so football is the winner. Give everybody a hand. Good job, everybody. All right. Great job. All right, uh, we're going to stand and sing, and after we're done with this song, Master Clubs, you can be dismissed, And uh, but we're going to sing together first. Open my eyes that I may see all three verses. Open my eyes that I Glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key. Then set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes and look. Christ my 
thy king, echoed in love, thy word shall ring, sweet as the note the angels sing. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. You may be seated, and the kids may be dismissed for Master Clubs. And while the kids are on their way, if you don't mind, take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. And while you're turning there, Sandy Johnson wrote and said that football won at the Johnson house. Nick wrote and said, baseball is the best at their house. Daniela wrote and she said, I lost against myself, but it's okay because I like ice hockey anyway. So, whatever. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see if there's anybody else on any of the other platforms. Nope, that'll do it. Okay, great. Thank you all for participating with us tonight. Uh, Matthew chapter 6. And verse 33, because uh, we're studying the book of Proverbs. So, again, we go to another non-Proverbs verse to get us started. And then we'll spend a lot of time in Proverbs this evening. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. We pretty well know this verse by heart. Let's say it together. Ready? Begin. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Um, just before we pray, let's uh, remember to pray for Andrew Wilson tonight. He uh, sent me a note this afternoon. He is uh, feeling ill today, so uh, just be praying for him. On the other hand, it's a blessing we got Brother Wolfgang in here with us tonight, so we'll take it. Amen. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you for your word. We pray that you'll bless as we uh, study tonight, as we learn, and uh, Father, help us as we grow uh, in our understanding of biblical priorities for each one of us. Um, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you may know the name uh, Charles Schwab. Not that any of you were old enough to know it, but more because of the investment company that is named after him. But he was a, um, a key figure in Andrew Carnegie's um, steel empire. And he was frustrated with his inability to get everything done. As a matter of fact, he once reluctantly agreed to meet with a consultant named Ivy Lee, who was recommended to him by John D. Rockefeller, who of course was a big business tycoon in those days, and Standard Oil and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, Lee's proposal was elegant and yet very simple. He told Schwab to make a list of the six most important things that he could do the next day to further the overall health and function of U.S. Steel. At the end of the day, Schwab was to review the list, move anything that had not been finished to the top of the next day's list, and then add enough items to make a total of six things again. Within 15 minutes, the meeting concluded. Lee told Schwab to follow this practice for 30 days and then send him a payment based on how much Schwab thought the advice was worth. At the end of the month, anybody want to guess how much uh, Schwab sent Lee a check for? He sent him a check, well, you've got to remember, this was back in Andrew Carnegie's day, so this was like a century ago now. He sent him a check for $25,000, which I would be okay with receiving now even, you know, 25000 would be pretty good. <laughs> Something um, far too often that we do is we treat what deserves to be treated with care as though we're really we're of little worth. I have started making kind of a, a fairly consistent habit of I've got a, a notebook that is the same color as this notebook and, and I write down the date for tomorrow in it and I'll write down the things that I want to get accomplished in it. 
And you want to know something? Since I started doing that, the things that I get done, I mean, it's amazing how much more I accomplish because it puts before my eyes my priorities for the day, the things that I want to get done. Unfortunately, a lot of times when we don't prioritize things, then a lot of things that should be done don't get done simply because we did not make them a priority for ourselves. That being true, one of the worst things about being a fallen creature is our failure to understand what's really important in life. I was just talking to my daughter Karen on the way in, uh, on the way in tonight, and um, and Karen and I were just talking about this very thing: how easy it is to allow unimportant things to become the most important things, and the most important things to kind of get pushed under the rug. Um, so here, here's, here's a simple thing for us, this is our introductory point. The overriding priority of the Christian life is to put God first. That's it. The overriding, listen, you know, we, we believe in evangelism around here. We pass out uh, thousands and thousands of tracts in the course of a month and, uh, and, and tens of thousands in the course of a year. We believe in sowing the seed. We believe in witnessing to people. But our overriding priority needs to be the, the glory of God, putting him first. Now, if we do that, guess what we're going to end up doing? <laughs> we'll tell other people about him. That's what it's all about. So if, if we make him our priority, then everything else will fall into place. To do otherwise is inconsistent with God's goal for the Christian life, and that's why we've got to determine to discover and apply biblical priorities for our personal lives. Now, I preach a message um, probably every three or four years on uh, priorities for busy believers. This is not the same message, though some of it will overlap. Notice, first of all, tonight, the priority of learning God's word. The priority of learning God's word. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So let me ask you this question. You help me out. Why should the Bible be such a high priority for believers? Why should the Bible be such a high priority for believers? Eddie. Okay, so it addresses our personal needs, which may mean it speaks to my heart a little bit differently than it speaks to others. Nanette. Amen. What goes in is what comes out. So if I put Bible into my heart and life, guess what's going to come out of my heart and life? It's going to be Bible and biblical principle. What else? This is good. Curtis. Oh, say it again. It's, uh, amen. The Bible is our roadmap. It's our direction for life. Listen, man, if I'm traveling someplace, I want to have Waze or a Rand McNally atlas or something. I want to know where I'm going, right? Most people are going through life without a clue as to where they're going, and that's why they're going to end up shocked when they don't end up with the Lord because they don't know where they're going. Uh, James. Why are you talking about me? <laughs> I, I love IKEA furniture as long as somebody else puts it together. Because I think I understand it, you know, and I've got it in my head, you know. I thought, okay, that goes there, that goes there. Yeah, but sometimes I'll skip a step, and you skip one step with a piece of IKEA furniture, and it throws everything off. Horrible that way. Don't talk about me like that, James. Okay. <laughs> uh, I saw somebody else's hand, I thought. Somebody else? Uh, yes, Vita. Amen. Instructions and answers for all of my confusion. That is exactly right. Listen, we need to learn the Bible for doctrine. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, now you might want to go there because we're going to be in Proverbs a lot tonight, and we'll be in a few other verses, but we're going to be in Proverbs mostly. Proverbs chapter 4, look at verses 1 and 2. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, 1, Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding, for I give you good doctrine forsake ye not my law now the word doctrine is from a word that means something received uh, it means instruction or learning and in the biblical sense doctrine is the scriptural basis for what we believe and what we practice uh, for those of you who've been around here for any time at all you know that when i was at north haven baptist church 
we had this um, lady, I used to do a Bible study in the base chapel there. They always put me in the nursery for some reason, but um, that's where we had our Bible study. And we'd do lunch and have Bible study and smell all kinds of cool things. Anyway, so we'd be there, and then um, I was on my way out, and this, uh, this chapel assistant comes running out, and she says, hey, we want to invite you. We're going to have a singspiration, and we're going to have just a great time of fellowship, and we're inviting all the churches. And I said, can you, uh, can you tell me what your doctrinal basis is for that? And she said, we don't care about doctrine. And I said, let me just help you with something. We're not going to be there because I don't want to spoil your time, but doctrine is very important to us. It's what we believe. It's the basis for what we practice. Um, when we are not solid on Bible doctrine, then we're opening up ourselves to all kinds of false teaching. In John chapter 7, verse 16, the Bible says this, John 7, 16, Jesus answered and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Verse 17, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Listen, we need to be men and women of doctrine. Now, we don't have to be arrogant, we don't have to be hard-headed, but we need to know what, where we stand. What we Listen, when you join a church, if you ever leave here, which I know you're not going to, but if you ever were to leave here and you're looking for another church, the first question you need to ask a preacher is, may I see a copy of your doctrinal statement? Don't worry about the programs and stuff. Listen, you can have wonderful programs, but if the doctrine's wrong, you don't want your kids in that church. You want doctrine, and then the programs can come along with that. And by the way, programs come, programs go. It all changes all the time. But doctrine never changes. Doctrine needs to stay the same. Then we need to learn doctrine for biblical living. For biblical living. Proverbs 4, verses 3 and 4. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. So doctrine for doctrine's sake really is just a waste of time. It's just knowledge. But doctrine that has a practical import in one's life enables a person to live for the Lord and to live a life for the Lord which is going to be pleasing in God's sight and ultimately that means it's going to be pleasing in our sight as well. So there's the priority of learning God's word, then there's the priority of obtaining godly wisdom. The priority of obtaining godly wisdom. Now the Bible makes it clear that it is essential for believers to get wisdom. The question is why? Why is it so important for us to get wisdom? A couple of reasons to develop personal maturity. Hey, listen, if any man lack wisdom, what does the Bible say? Let him ask of God, who giveth liberally to all men and abradeth not. God's never going to scold you for asking for wisdom. Why? Because we need wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 4, verses Five and following, get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee, love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. You know what's a tragedy in the day we're living in right now, in this post-Christian, post-modernist world that we're living in? Nobody's teaching their kids how to be wise. We have kids that are so confused, and they're just listening to whatever they're taught, whatever they're, whatever they're taught at school, or whatever they're taught on social media, whatever they're taught by friends. Listen, your friends are not your friends if they're not teaching you how to get wisdom from God and His Word. By the way, gaining in wisdom is also an indicator that a person is maturing. Have you ever ever thought to yourself, you know, like, I mean, when I was a teenager, when I was five years old, my dad was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. When I was 10, there were some cracks. When I was a teenager, he was an idiot. When, when I became 21, dad, he was smart again. And now that he's gone, man, my dad was one of the most brilliant people on the, in the whole face of the earth. I mean, he's just amazing. Yes, we go through that phase, but I want you to know something. 
part of maturing is to recognize wisdom in others and the need for wisdom in our own lives. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says this, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. That's gaining in wisdom. So it's to develop personal maturity, but also to develop personal integrity. Proverbs chapter 4, look at verses 8 and 9. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace. A crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. To embrace is to clasp or to enfold. You know, we might say it's like getting a hug, right? And God's people who enfold God's wisdom into their daily living are men and women of character and integrity. It's an amazing thing. But people who know the Bible and live the Bible, even the lost world will say, well, they've got integrity. They have integrity. And that's a great thing. Number three, the priority of practicing godly living. The priority of practicing godly living. So here's a question. Why should godly living be important to us as Christians? Why should godly living be important to us? Help me out. What do you think? Amen. It's our testimony. It's, it's, it's our witness, right, Mike? Because it glorifies the Lord. Amen. What else? Why should, why should um, our godly living, why should that be important to us? Amen. Better consequences, good consequences. Remember, you can choose your actions, but you can't choose your consequences. So if you choose good actions, better consequences. Amen. There's a ton of good stuff we could say there. Um, here's a couple of things. It'll guide you uh, um, into right paths. It'll guide you. If you practice godly living, it's going to guide you into right paths. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 10 and 11 says, Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. So it's going to guide you into right paths. Listen, spend more time in your Bible, you're going to have a better time finding the right path to go. Man, I got a decision. Should I do, take this job? Should I not take this job? Should I take this assignment? Should I not? Get in your Bible. God will give you clarity. God will give you the direction. He'll help you to make that decision. Not only that, it'll grow you in right ways. It'll grow you in right ways. In Proverbs chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. And when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. So when we practice biblical wisdom, when we practice biblical teaching, when we exercise godly living, our path is going to be straight. We're not going to get swayed off of the path because we're on the right path and it's going to help us to live right. Right paths, right ways are vital as we seek to live for the Lord, but they're also important as we try to point other people to the Lord. Have you ever, now just don't raise any hands, okay, no, no hand raising here, but have you ever been living out of the will of God and then tried to witness to somebody? That is a futile exercise. Because people know how you're living. So why are they going li to listen to us when we say, hey, you ought to trust the Lord. It's true, they ought to trust the Lord. But our testimony in the negative is affecting our ability to point people to Christ. Listen, living for the Lord is an active pursuit. It is not just, hey, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven and that's enough. You ought to get saved too. No, they want to see the difference that it's going to make. Then notice number four, the priority of avoiding sinful influences. The priority of avoiding sinful influences. It ought to be obvious to us that godly living is important, but what kind of a difference does it make? 
what's going to keep us from wrong paths, Proverbs 4, verses 14 and 15, enter not into the path of the wicked, go not in the way of evil men, avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it and pass away. So it's going to keep me from going in the wrong path. You know, I grew up on a dairy farm. One of the things about cows is they always make a path. Always. So you can go down to my dad's place when, when we had the farm. You could go to his place, and you would see all over the fields these pathways. And they were just made because the cows said, that's the path I'm taking. And then they just line up one behind another. And after, you know, a couple of weeks of doing that, you saw you didn't make the path they did. But they got on that one path. And here's why. Because they knew where it was going. They knew that it was going to end up back at the barn. That's food. That's hay. That's water. They knew where it was going to take them. Do you know what reading God's word will do for you? It will take you in the right direction. People say, well, that's so old-fashioned. You know, it's really funny to me because when we were following the Word of God as a nation, we were at our pinnacle as far as influence in the world. And we are not following God's Word as a nation today, and we are losing our influence in the world. We are losing it quickly. You say, what should we do? Go back to the old paths. Go back to the Bible. I'm not saying that you have to go back and look like a, you know, like a pilgrim that just came off the Mayflower. That's all I'm saying. I'm saying the principles that are contained within the Word of God are going to lead us in the right way that we ought to live our lives and it will give us the greater influence in our world. Not only is it going to keep us from wrong paths, but it's going to keep us from wrong people wrong people. You ever had any wrong people in your life? Me, you, sure. All of us have had some wrong people in our lives that have led us in the wrong direction. Look at verses 16 and 17. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For they sleep not, except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away, unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness, and drink the wine of violence. This is the non-Bible believer. This is the non-Bible liver, the law, the, uh, the, the non-Bible practicer. And if we hang around them, don't be surprised when we start acting just like them. Now please, let's throw some balance in here. There is absolutely nothing wrong with Christians having lost friends. But you know what there is something wrong with? spending the majority of your time with lost friends. We need the encouragement that comes from being with each other. Brother Eddie, I appreciate how you prayed when you opened the service tonight. He said, and afterwards, help us just to enjoy the fellowship together. You know what one of the marks of a good church is? How long it takes to get people out the door. Man, I've been in churches in the state so many times. I mean, it was like, wow, there's all of these people here. But as soon as the service was over, it was like this tornado came through and took everybody away. I mean, they were gone in seconds. You ever watch, you know, like the Roadrunner cartoon and all those little squirrely air things that go fast as he goes zipping by? That's what it's like in some churches. It's crazy. I'm thinking, that's not a healthy church. That's not where I want to be. I want to be where people are going to hang out with each other. I want to be where people are going to laugh together and talk together and pray together and weep with each other and enjoy each other and serve each other. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. I hope that's true in your life as well. Listen, where you go and who you hang around with says a lot about the spiritual quality of your life. That's just all there is to it. Some people, let's just be honest about it, some people, some Christian people are probably people we shouldn't hang around with because they've made bad choices. But if we hang around with them too often and too long, we're going to end up making some of those bad choices as well. So we need to avoid sinful influences. Number five, the priority of achieving spiritual growth. Remember Matthew 6.33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. 
Back in Proverbs 4 and verses 18 and 19 says this, but the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more under the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Understand this, growth will help you shine for the Lord. You keep growing in the word of God. You keep growing in your walk with God. You are going to shine for his glory. In the fire department, we did two things, and only two things. We responded to emergencies, and we knew how to polish trucks. That was it. That was our whole job right there. Respond to an emergency, and then polish trucks. You know what? The Lord, through his word, through his doctrine, through spiritual living, he's shining your life. He's making your life shine in a dark world. And not only that, but growth is going to keep you from stumbling. To stumble is to totter or to waver, and especially through weakness. And what we're talking about tonight is we're talking about spiritual weakness. Spiritual growth is going to help you to shine for the Lord. It's going to help you to be strong for the Lord. So there's the priority of achieving spiritual growth. We ought to all have that desire. Remember, discipleship is all of us doing life together, helping one another, growing together as we seek to honor and glorify the Lord through our church, but also through our individual lives. Number six, the priority of following godly direction. The priority of following godly direction. Here's a question for you. What does this phrase mean to you? What's it mean to you? Knowledge is not enough. What does that mean to you? When you hear that phrase, knowledge is not enough, what does that say to you? Kibbe? Amen. Okay, so you got it in your head. Great. What are you doing with it? What else does it mean? When you hear knowledge is not enough, Deb? Amen. Don't be hearers only, but be doers. Doers of the word. Amen. What else? Knowledge is not enough. What does that say to you? Missy. Amen. So we've got all kinds of people, even people in our community right here. Man, they know what the Bible says. They know about Jesus. They know about God, but they don't know God. They don't have a relationship with God through faith in Christ. Well, that's not enough. You have to know Christ. You have to have a personal relationship with him if you're going to shine for the Lord. Um, Look at Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 22. Proverbs 4, verses 20 through 22. My son, attend to my words, incline thy ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. So there's two things we need. We need to learn to hear God's word. Listen, I know you're sick and tired of hearing it, but do you read your Bible every day? Because if you don't, you need to. Because if what you get is all you get here, you're not getting very much. You need daily Bible. I need daily Bible. You should come up to me sometime and say, hey, preacher, read your Bible today? Because preachers have bad days too. So we need a mutual accountability that helps each one of us to remember, hey, hear the word of God, listen to it. For me personally, you know me, I'm an audio book junkie. I do my devotional time. I listen to the word of God as I read the word of God. So I'm getting eye contact, ear contact, and many times I'll even speak it as it's going on. So I get ear, mouth, and eyes all going on at the same time. And if maybe if my Bible had strawberry flavoring, I'd sniff it. Too. I don't know, but you know, you get the idea. You get the idea, right? So to incline means to stretch toward, to bend in the direction of, or to extend myself toward. And that's the way we ought to be toward the Bible. We ought to be stretching forward to the Bible. 
on a regular basis. Why? Because it's going to give us the wisdom that we need. Then learn to apply God's word. Learn to apply it. It's not just the hearing, it's the doing. To find in uh, Proverbs 4, to find means more than just to locate. It means to acquire. Acquire. You know, some guy goes, he's uh, really interested in a girl, and he's going to go get her a diamond ring. And so he goes and he finds it. That doesn't mean that he just found it at the store. No, that means he found the right ring and he bought it. And now he's just waiting for the right opportunity to put it on her finger. And she's going to marry him. That's what he wants to do. So that's finding it more than just location. That's finding to acquire so that I can then put it to work in my life. That means making it a real part of my life through personal application on a regular basis. Number seven, the last one, the priority of exercising godly discipline. The priority of exercising godly discipline. So, so our jumping off verse, Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God. You know, just doing that requires discipline. Just doing that. There are many things that I do when I get up in the morning. So I, I'm, tr I'm trying to learn Spanish. Tu hablas español? Si? Okay. So I'm trying to learn a little bit of Spanish. Um, trying to, uh, try, you know, trying to keep my brain sharp. I don't want to, my dad died of dementia and Parkinson's disease. I don't want to go down that road. One of the best things that I've read is that just keep your brain active. Keep, you know, exercising your brain. Is that true, uh, Nanette? You're the, you're the doctor or the nurse. So, well, the nurse that keeps the doctors out of trouble. That's you. And so, so that's what we want to do, keep our brains active, right? That's what we want to do. Well, that's what we need to be doing here. We need to be exercising our brains, exercising godly discipline. Uh, Proverbs 4.23 and following, keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips. Put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. So discipline starts in one's heart, but then discipline impacts one's life. And Jesus was exactly right when he said that the things that come out of the mouth actually proceed from the heart. It comes from the heart. You know what's one of the dangers of getting angry? Things come out of our heart that we did not intend to come out of our mouths. We need to be careful about our heart. You say, how do I take care of my heart? The way you take care of it is by establishing some biblical priorities and keeping the Word of God number one in your life every day. Amen? Let's stand together. Patrick's going to come and lead us in a invitation song and we're going to invite you to come or to kneel right where you are or to stand right where you are but we're going to invite you to come let's sing it together our invitation song um, turn your eyes upon jesus Death into life ever 
everlasting. He passed and we follow him there. Over us and no more hath dominion. For more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon just take your outline sheet and flip it over that would be great we're going to say good night to all of our friends who are watching from home tonight thank you for being with us appreciate that so much 